question, if uh, Rav Lachman will allow. It's a, it's a big cover to have Rav Lachman uh, with us this afternoon. Uh, isn't that the day? Isn't, isn't that one. the day? Rebbe, we can't hear you, so if you're protesting to the introduction, I, I don't even know about it. Number one, on a personal level, it. it gives me a chance to uh, to offer some Akar Satov. Personally, Rebbe was 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 my uh, my 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 at the time that I was in Karen Biavna. Rebbe is no uh, stranger to giving Shirim and YU for the newer guys. It's been a couple of years since Rebbe was on campus, so uh, uh, we're, we're happy to have another opportunity. The first time I heard Rebbe was on campus, 1997, a Tish Friday night. My brother, I was in MTA, I was in 11th grade, and my brother brought me uh, to, uh, to Yeshiva for Shabbos, and I uh, was pretty much sold on KBY uh, already at the time. And uh, I think the last time Rebbe came to, to Yeshiva for Shabbos, I spoke in the cafeteria and I received from there some very well-deserved but significant Musar afterwards. So I'm going to curtail my own statement so I don't get into trouble again. But I will say on behalf of, of the Chavra here, Yeshiva's been a semester and Baruch Hashem has grown in many ways over the years. And ultimately, I think the credit for the inception goes back some 15, 20 years or so. Rabbi Lachman encouraged Mickey Elman and uh, David Prell at the time. Uh, to, uh, to uh, exemplary Talmidim uh, of our yeshiva, going back uh, from when I was a, a bachar in the base medrash, um, to, to create a context and a structure for, for guys to, uh, to stay strong and keep this mind going, even during the time when, uh, when there are no classes and there are no courses going on, and to maintain the culture in the base medrash. And the fact that we have literally dozens of guys it, it, live in yeshiva on campus and also via Zoom uh, is a testament to the success of that initiative. So uh, it, it's our opportunity to thank Rav Lachman for, for making that, uh, uh, help, help bring that into reality so many years ago. Without any further ado, thank you so much, Rebbe, for joining us today. Thank you for your kind words. Does everybody hear me? I'm hoping that, yes. Um, is this going to be filmed, Rabbi Schnall? I don't hear. Unmute yourself. It is currently recording, but we can stop the recording if Rebbe would prefer. No, no, no. I just need you after to send it to my G drive. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure that Rebbe gets it. <laughs> okay. I'd also ask the different people here with their black faces. I'd like to see who they are. Uh, people here on, uh, don't want to show their faces. I, I, you have to put on your makeup. There's no chayim. Hello. You don't want to see you. Okay. Uh, you know, Mr. Anonymous, I don't know. God even asked to talk pun him to pun him. So why would you want to hear me talk pun him to some black face? Good. Oh, I see Mr. Younger. Are you still in Chicago? Still in Cincinnati, Rabbi. Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. The Ari Miklet over there. It's in Manhattan. Okay, Shai. Uh, good Shabbos. Why are people wearing masks? Oh, because you're in a Shetta Harabim. I have to understand what's happening here. Uh, I see. Two of your Goldstein just joined. Okay. Okay. Um, let's talk about something that, um, um, you know, the, the cloud is that the, in Divri Torah, anything which is new is Al Kor Chachnat Torah. Because if it's Torah, obviously, uh, somehow it lies in the Kabbalah of Moshe Messina. So uh, one would almost say, you know, what does it mean to have a Chiddush? Uh, and the answer lies basically in two primary sources. One is a Rashi at the end of um, Kohelis. On the passive Enko Chodesh Tachas Hashem, so it writes over there, the Rashi, the, um, uh, Rashi brings the Medrash, that Mitachas Hashem Enko Chodesh, interesting. Nothing is new. Science at the best is trying to discover that which is. We're not trying to create new things which weren't there. We're trying to find, oh, after we apply and make the other thing, but the chigufa of Chiddush is already there. We're trying to uncover it. Yet when it comes to Torah, he says there is Chodesh mita me'al Hashemesh, which really sounds like almost impossible to understand. And Rashi says, Moshe Lama Adavadayma is a tinaik, which is yoinik min hadad. A suckling which sucks the milk, the nourishment from his mother's breast. Now, I don't exactly remember the experience, so I can't describe it uh, vividly, but Rashi seems to be saying that every time the child uh, uh, like feels the breast, he somehow has another flavor in that, in that nourishment that he's, uh, that he's having, which is very interesting. The implication seems to be that a chiddush 
is not the information, but the subjective relationship with it, the tam, tam a right? flavor. You, you, you attain a certain understanding, a certain flavor, and that, this is probably understood with the, uh, what Reb Chaim Velazhener writes, it's brought down in Kesser Reish, which are the Anhagas of Reb Chaim Velazhener, um, they're printed in the back of uh, Siddur, some Siddur Agra, some version of the Siddur Agra. And there he writes, what is Chidusha Torah? Chidusha Torah is clarity. If you have more clarity in something, that's called Chidush. Chidush is not in, in, in the information. Chidush is the understanding. To what extent is that uh, you walked away from using cliches and actually started actually understanding subjectively what you're really listening to. That, that, that's a, um, that's not great to Chidush. It's out there, like the Chazal say, that and also at the end of Kehelis, when it says, Balei Asufos. So Rashi brings it, say, Gemara, that ain the Vitoira, that a, a Talmud is not Oymid al Das Rabbi until he's Nesaf, until he's, uh, until he's dead. It's a Medrash. You can only understand Das Rabbi after he's dead. Why? It's a never Pasha, because when he's alive, you attach yourself to the externalities, not to you. You don't, you, you collect your notebook. You fill your notebook with information, but it's only after the man is not there anymore to give you more information. You start trying to figure out his silences, his nuances, his thin way of thinking, his way of feeling. And that's when you're Ayman al Das Rabbi. This is the advice of the truth. I hate to say it, that I've experienced it, so I know it's true. Uh, I experienced it both as a Talmud and both as a Rav. <laughs> so I know, I know how true it is. Um, this is some of the idea of Chiddush. Chiddush means you have clarity. I need a certain clarity. And some sugyas which become the mainstream of your, of your worldview get different clarity every time you're misasik on them. So I'm going to ask Mechilas, whoever may think that he have heard what I'm about to say before, listen carefully and attentively and you will hear a new flavor. Because, you know, you get older, you um, uh, feel things differently. And here it goes. Well, the topic I want to talk to is about is specifically about Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, I doubt I'm going to have time to do the whole uh, spiel. I'm going to start. I'm going to start, and I'd like to talk about the person. Now, in order to understand the remarks that I'm about to give, I must put down a certain, uh, also an axiomatic idea, his side, which uh, I don't believe there's a way of walking away from it. And that is, as I many times have asked my students, how do we define the Chamisha Chum Shatayra? How do we find the book? Now, I'm talking at the level of, if you have a book, okay, in, the, in Barnes and Nobles, under what label would it be? And that's the question on the table. How would we categorize the Chamisha Chum Shatayra? Now, logically, you one would have thought in the beginning, you know, I figure it's a history book. It's telling the history of the Jews, like Paul Johnson. I don't know, telling the history of the Jews in the in the um biblical in the um that era. But anybody reading the book realized that's really off the charts wrong. Simply by the bare fact that there are, not only are there major holes in the history, but there's no sequence. You open up a Tanit the Seder Island, which finally describes the sequence of the biblical era. Let me tell you, the Chumash, if you wouldn't know Tanit the Seder Island, is all off the charts. Uh, one typical example we parse is Lech Lecha. It's all Fakir. Lech Lecha happened after the Brisbane Absorum. For example, Brisbane Absorum preceded that, if you really want to know. Okay, also the Melechemes HaMalachim is not put in the right place. It, that's really an interesting parsha where everything was stripped and turned. Rashi Taka believes because of that, as a general rule, and Mugdumu Mulchabatayra Bichlal in Pshat. Ramban Ibn Ezra, as those who are a bit more well read, know that they try their best to understand the things in sequence, and if they can't, they resort to Ain Mugdumu Mulchabatayra. Rashi has no problem of ease doing this very easily. This is found all over whoever learns Chumash with Rashi and Ramban. We'll see this in multiple places. Well, obviously, one of the first defining factors of a history book is to teach you the historical sequence. And since this book is basically uh, whatever the sequence is, it is not historical. So one must come to conclusion that the celestial author did not even want to write a history book. 
then we have to understand what exactly is the sequence, okay? What, 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 the, what is the idea? What is the sequence? There must be a justifiable sequence to the, uh, to the, the order of the book. And then, well, we look carefully. Is it a novel, an historical novel? Like how, Mitchner, I don't know, an historical novel. And the answer is also, it would be a very bad novel. It's a novel. I mean, you, you wouldn't pass English lit. I mean, for goodness sakes, the characters are not fleshed out in any form or size. Um, example, let's talk examples. Avram Avinu, what do you know about him by just reading Chumash? Nothing. No one was born. He had a father called Terach. You know nothing about his background. And, was, and his father had moved away from Ur Kasdim to uh, Ram Narayim, the Haran, that over there, which is very interesting. We don't know why. I repeat, I'm learning the Chumash without all the uh, allegorical, allegorical uh, editions found in Midrash. Midrash. Who's reading Chumash? They garnish. The book doesn't say anything. Can you imagine if an author writes a book and since he wants to tell a story, well, you have to read the appendix. There's only one book I know, which is based on appendix and sub-appendix that's been by Nussin, whatever his name is, Kamenetsky, making of a goggle. I don't know where the book is and where the appendix is on. It's all mixed up. But outside of that, regular books don't have that. The genre does not allow it. You write a book, you're supposed to flesh out your characters. I don't know. All of a sudden, there's some guy called Abraham, which comes on the stage and God talks to him, tells him, go Hilter Skelter somewhere. Who is he? No clue. It's a very important question to ask. What did the author want? Why did the author tell me who he is? Um, same thing you would ask about, you say, I would hope that he was a happily married man. Well, the fact of the matter is she stayed around with him for a long time, was his partner in his, uh, in his uh, quest. And it seems to record only, what is it, two or three conversations in their whole life. First one, he suddenly wakes up in the morning. He's like 70 some years old. He says, hey, you actually look good. I hate to tell it to you, you will get married one day, um, as soon as, whenever proper. You've got, you must compliment your wife at least thrice daily. And this guy gives one compliment in a backhanded way at the age of 70, Arachmanus, Abrach. How did that marriage last? You really think that's the truth? That would be ludicrous to think they didn't talk. The Torah also doesn't tell me how they dated. Did they go ice skating in Rockefeller Center? Like, what did they do? You don't know. Because the Torah is not interested in telling you that. Because not what the Torah wants to do. God, the author, wants to write a book without a fleshed out character, just wants to describe certain episodes in their lives, not in historical sequence and not in any not, not any idea of building a character and describing the character's life. Not at all. For example, what do you know about Sora? All you know, she was jealous about this hogger and couldn't stand the other and the Shmoy asked them out. What do you know about it? Nothing. Oh, what do we know about Srifka? Well, all the pseudo scholars will say, of course, she had a lousy marriage. She went behind her husband's back to get the brachas for her son. You know, it's, it's like someone deciding to do a psychoanalysis of my personality based on meeting me once for 20 minutes. That would be less than ludicrous. It wouldn't even, it, it would not, it, you would cover it with fish in the market. It's a meaningless piece of paper. How could you possibly analyze a personality from uh, some sparse occurrences? And the answer really is we are not interested in the personalities of the biblical characters as people. We have no way of knowing them, no clue. It's not because they're holy rollers and we're too small. That's all nice and cute. Without that, as a, as a person which learned literature, you cannot, the author did not describe the characters. He didn't really give you much, gave you very little. The author does not want to write a literature book. He does not want to write a history book. What is he doing? He's taking small, disjointed, non-sequential occurrences of, of history and having what we call short stories. This is O. Henry. This is basically God took snippets of history, formed them to short story forms, and put them together and that's your Bible. The character in a short story is nothing more than a means towards an end. You look, you use the character as a ways of presenting an idea, a message. That's what the short story writer is doing. 
you, you get enmeshed in those characters only in context of that story. You know, nothing before, nothing ever. I never saw a Sefer Oy Henry with a Pirish of, I know, of Medrash Tzioy. You know what I mean? I don't think any writes a Medrash. You'd be a fool. You'd be under my, you're like take, take, you know, Henry's story and make it into a big literature. Very nice. Well, Henry didn't mean it. But whatever his name really was, doesn't matter. The Chashtus. The genre is one which does not want, does not demand uh, f- fleshing out the characters because you really don't have to know them. You have to know what is coming out of the story and understand the characters in that context and nothing more. So should you ever see um, literature which tries to psychoanalyze biblical characters, do me a favor, laugh. Because they're not academic and they're, they're below par. They, they simply um, totally miss the mark of what the book is supposed to be. Although it's quite common, but the Maratis is also very common, so I wouldn't be that much concerned. Now that um, that should be obvious, in light of this, if I'm going to analyze a biblical character, I, that's why I'm doing this. I don't want, I want you to say, I'm not analyzing my Rabbeinu. I have no clue about him, honestly. If I would think of him in his marriage, I'd say, God, Nothing there, you know. I mean, except he had two kids, and she did a bris mila there once on the way on the highway. Garnished, didn't he buy her flowers? Nothing. Garnish. What do we do here with all these marriages? Rachel is loved by Yaakov. Yeah, what? How often does he talk to her? What do you know? When she asked him for a child, and she screams, he screams at her. That's all I know. Obviously, he loved her. Obviously, they spoke endless hours. He must have taken her out on dates. No, did stargazing. He was a shepherd. I don't know what he did. You know, uh, he they, they had a great life together. I'm sure she. They had a beautiful life together. Totally irrelevant to me. Maybe he was abusive. I don't know what he was. I don't care. I do not care about who they were. I don't care about any of them at all. They have no religious significance to me. What I care about is the literary character depicted in the Bible, Chumash, Dvar Hashem, which is used as a message, as a medium through which God tells us his teachings and his dialogue with man. He chooses to tell us what he wants us to know vis-a-vis these literary characters, which happen to be real characters, but we only know them in context of literature. This is something which is very, very important when we go and we start analyzing the Muyota Mikra, that we do not analyze the people, we analyze the literary character in context and therefore trying to understand the message coming out of that. As I told you, in the gift of the Magi, I will try to understand the characters in light of the story. I will not try to understand the characters out that outside of that. I don't have the information. So that's what Chumash really is. It's Tvar Hashem, if you read the Ramban and the Adama to Taira, it's Tvar Hashem, the Daira Dairis, vis a vis these characters. Now, every generation has a different tool of deciphering that Tvar Hashem. Ramban says, Mufurish, he said that all that Shlomo Amelech, how did he, what was the book that he learned, Sikhas, the Kalim Vaifais? From the Chumash. I hate to say it, doesn't say that Moshe Rabbeinu saw it, knew it. Knew it. Uh, Rabban says, where did Yechezkel see the, um, uh, the nevuah of the Merkava? Very, very profound nevuah from the Chumash. I hate to say it, that Yemiyot didn't see the Merkava. That means he didn't see it in the Chumash. Every generation is going to have other tools to decipher what that generation can and should decipher to understand the Dvar Hashem coming out of the Chumash. That's why, yes, there will always be, it's there. It was always there. The question is not every generation will have the tools to see it. Obviously God is Yosef. God is in constant dialogue with man through this Chumash. And obviously talking to each generation through the generation's tools, expecting each person, each generation to use the tools available to understand the Tzvar Hashem. This is a very big achrayis. So I know it's easy to say vorts, since he's do all that, but they ain't worth stuff to cover fish in the market. 
Your question has to be, you're taking and making a major responsibility of looking at the Chumash and the, and the personalities. And what do you feel? Or obviously feeling is not enough. Feel is a gush that didn't buy a need. That would feel that you intuit that it is accurate and true. It's what you intuit, which is accurate and true. And it's, it's not just a guessing game and a beautiful maybe but something that you can use serious tools with and say, yes, academically, this is sound, that, is, that, that has theological value. I say this because we're in a, we, 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 there are multitudes of literature which are very inspiring when it comes to saying sermons out of the Chumash. Your question has to be, to what extent do those sermons have any theological value? Theological value does not come because something is beautiful and inspiring. I hate to say it's the most inspiring speeches I ever saw were from Baptist preachers. I don't think their words have much theological value, if anything. Okay, and reform rabbis, they're great. Okay. Um, I was once in a certain place for a Shabbos and was, uh, was foraging through the library of the rabbi there. And I found like in a shelf, he had all these books of all these interesting sources for sermons. I figure it's very good. That's what you call the rabbi's manual. If what you're looking for is inspiration, you know, like an NCSY Ebbing or something like that, like I met God on Killington or, you know what I mean? Or things like that. Then, 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 then it doesn't have to be theological sound. What you really want to do is just to turn people on to a value. It's a means towards an end, which you may or not be legitimate. I'm not going there at the moment. But if you want to learn theological value, it must be something which you, you, at least you intuit through logical thinking and tools that this is actually accurate. It can't just be a beautiful maybe. Possibilities, maybes are simply not enough, and not based enough to be of any theological value. I hope this is understood in context. Um, that's, I see, say all of this before I start my own analysis. Obviously you understand, I'm putting down all the disclaimers before I start this. In light of the aforementioned, I would like to look, if you don't mind, at the personality of Moshe Rabbeinu. He's very complex. And I'd like to start at the beginning. I mean, he really has a very interesting job. He's the only person I know which quit his job and got accepted the resignation. At the end of Parshas Baalaischa, he gets fed up with his uh, congregation, the Jews. He says, they're a bunch of Baalei Taiba and I can't solve it. And God, you can slaughter all the meat in the world. They will never have enough. He's nicely saying they are, they, 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 they are simply irrational and have obsessive desires. And I can't deal with that. Find them a shrink. So I'm quitting. Right? And God says, right, I accept your resignation. You're a lousy shrink and a lousy leader. I'm taking in 70 people, making a Congress, and they will lead with them. That's when you had the Sanhedrin. Yeshivim him. That's actually God. It's like Trump saying, you're fired. That used to be an old TV program. God did not fire him. But God accepted his resignation. That's pretty bad. It's a nice way of saying God agreed that as a leader of a nation, he was deficient. Not deficient enough to be fired, like Eliyahu Navi. Eliyahu Navi was fired. If you read the Navi, he goes to the Mount Har Sinai, and he complains about the Jews in a very, very, very sharp way. Woo! And then God gives him this unbelievable celestial sound and, sh and light show. It's at Har Sinai, and the message of that whole thing is Lo Berash Hashem. God is not found in those who scream too loud and complain. It's the still silent voice, which is godly. It was a very simple way of saying, can you please tone down? You're talking about my children. And then immediately after he gave him this, this lesson, which he hoped that Elio would understand, he says to ask him again, Malachap Elio, what are you doing here? And he expects him to now say whatever he wants to say in a different tone. And he just goes back and, you know, goes rabid, just screaming, oh, and he gives all, he does everything. Well, they killed the Nevi'im, they're terrible. And God says, I guess the time has come. You're being kicked up to the house of lords. You're no good for here. 
and that's when he was fired. So we have one person that was fired in history from his prophetic job, one person which God did not fire but accepted his resignation. And that's a very something which is very, it's a bit of a taint on his resume. One has to understand this person from, it's literally me, Igor, Rama, Labira, Mikta, what happened here? Who is that person? Who is the person which is, brings God down to heaven through Taira? As the Medrash says in Shir Hashirim, that the Shekhinah, so to speak, due to the different sins of the generations, moved me, me, Aritz, Lerikia, Shvi. And the first one that broke the glass ceiling of bringing the Shekhinah down from Rikia Shvi into Rikia Shishi is Maishu Rabbeinu. The Medrash says that prior to Maishu Rabbeinu, prior to Matan Taira, there was a Xera of El Yonim Lamala Vetachtonim Lamata. It was Moshe Rabbeinu which broke the glass ceiling and allowed El Yonim to come Lamata Vetachtonim Dalot Lamala. Great man. Unbelievable prophet. It seems to be lousy king. Couldn't handle the flock. Couldn't handle the heat. He's complex. I want to understand him a bit more. Not him, but what is described in the Mikra? And why does God tell this to me? What is the message God wants to tell me by depicting X amount of episodes in his life? I have to learn that. What does it mean to me? So let's start with his life. His life begins and it's actually, it's, it's presented in two stages, one in Pasha Shmais and then in Pasha Zvaira. So in Pasha Zvaira, which is this week's Pasha, he's presented as a normal human being, which has a father and has a mother and has, has a brother and a sister and nephews and cousins, you know, uncles, the works. They really present a very, very nice picture. And that's the beginning of this week's Parsha. Yes, it says, who is this Moshe Aaron? Here it goes in Shmos, Perik Vav. It says, after it says in the Pasuk in, um, it says, by Debe Hashem el Moshe ve'el Haron ve'itzavim of Nei Yisrael ve'el Paro me'ach Mitzrayim. Lo'od si if Nei Yisrael me'ach Mitzrayim. These are the two people appointed to be what we would call the redeemers of the Jews from bondage. And then there's a whole few psukim. But hey, with Rashi based on those, someone who starts saying there's a Reuben, and he had a bunch of children. And then of course there's Shimon, he had a bunch of children. And then there's Levi, that he has a bunch of children. And out of the Levi, he had a grandson called Kahas. He had a son called Kahas, and Kahas had an Amram. And then there's Merori, all the other cousins, and Amram married Yochevet. And then all of a sudden, what do we have? And what children did he have? He had Aaron and Moshe and Miriam. And who did Aaron marry? It says, you know, we like to know he, he married into the princely family of Judah. And as I invite, it's a very, and even who did Moshe's nephew marry? It's really interesting to see. Okay, all this is brought here. And we end up and we say, who Aaron and Moshe? Who means to say he? This is who the person is. The Pusik is clearly underlining without going into the repetition, etc., which is not what I'm going to do today, is I um, want to say that for these redeemers of the people were people of family. They were uncles, they were brothers, they were sisters. They had a father, they had a mother, a grandfather, everything is there. This is the this is introducing Moshe as a guy in the family, grew up in the hood. You know what I mean? He's part of the guys. He went to school with everybody. He's a normal person. But this is only the second introduction of Moshe Rabbeinu to the book. And the Pasha Shmais is introduced totally differently. Well, let's look at Pasha Shmais for a moment. Here the story goes that um, there was an anonymous man of the Levy family, which married an anonymous woman of the Levy family. That's all it says. We don't choose to tell the name. What is the author doing here? You're going to tell us the name soon. No, no. At this stage, his name, the names are not relevant. An anonymous man, Vayelech Ishmi Beit Levi, Vayikach Et Bat Levi. 
Does it say he was a grandson? Does it say the name? Does it say Amram Godel Adoroya? Nothing. But Tara Isha, the lady was impregnated, Vatelid Ben, and she bore a male. Vatera Oisha Kitai. Now try to read Chumash. What does that mean? Well, Taib is a subjective reaction, as we know the Rambam in Mary Nebuchim Chelik Alapiric base. Taib is not describing what he is, but what kind of reaction I have to it. In locker room language, when you say, oh, she's good, you're not describing what she is, you're describing what reaction you have towards her. You talk, oh, that's a tasty meal. You're not describing what it is, you're describing what it is for you. It's a subjective term. One will never say the earth is round, that's good. That would be quite ludicrous. You would say it's accurate. There's a far cry between accuracy and good. Uh, for example, one million and one million is two million. That's accurate in simple arithmetic. Is it also good? Well, that would depend. If it's the back taxes I have to pay, it's bad. If it's the tax returns that I get from the IRS because I gave too much, that's good. In other words, the, when we talk about truth, the word good and bad are highly irrelevant. Usage of good and bad in terms like that are bad. I always tell people when they say, Rebbe, that was a nice, that was a beautiful shear. I say, my wife is supposed to be beautiful. Torah is supposed to be accurate. Okay, beauty is irrelevant to Torah. Uh, it, it facilitates it, makes it pleasant, it was inspiring. That's very sweet. Did he also tell you the truth or was he fibbing? The question has to be, is it accurate or is it not? Is it Tyra? Is it not Tyra? If it's not, it was beautiful Shekhar. Oh, that was a beautiful Shekhar, Rebbe. You know, if you say that, that'd be ultimate. You know, I'm trying to say you, Tyra demands accuracy. Maybe some possibilities you can cover fish in the market. You got to prove this, man. Is it true? That's the question on the table. Will you, my father used to tell me, will you be Matri Naguna with this for him? If not, keep your mouth shut. That's a simple cloud. Big cloud in Tyra. You'll be Matri Naguna with it? Roll with it. You won't? Hush. But it's beautiful. It answers all the questions. So what? Since when do we work with mathematics through a sense of aesthetics? It's like trying to solve mathematical problems through poetry. It, it, it's, it's totally mad. There's not even a how many of this makes sense. Um, I suggest you, that, that's the language you're supposed to understand when you're learning Torah. Is it emes or sheket? Toiv, ra, matok, chamut, lo relevanti. Pashut mode, it's not relevant at all. It's irrelevant. At the best, it makes it pleasanter to facilitate or to internalize. But they can never be the acid test. The acid test must be very accuracy. Proven academic truth. Then we can talk business. Without that, it's just nothing. So you must understand what happens here is the Torah here chooses not to tell us anything. Did he have a name? He was circumcised, obviously. But Torah doesn't tell us that. I'm telling you, did he have a name? Well, we know who daddy and mommy were. I promise you he had a bris. They even gave out herring there, for all I know. Okay, did they give him a name? Did someone stand with Amida Lebrachas? From a some Arab, or whatever they called someone in Amida Lebrachas? Yitzar ben Levi, Amida Lebrachas. Of course they had that. The Karsh Rebbe, you saw, what did they call him? Well, look at the Midrashim. Tuvia, Avigdor, he had like seven names. He, he's one of these guys that had like a Chesidish Ainukla, had like eight names, and they used one. He also had a lot of names, a lot of Hebrew names. Does anybody know his Hebrew names? Most of you never heard them. And no one ever uses them. Interesting, he at the moment doesn't have a name. He doesn't have a dad, he doesn't have a mom, he doesn't have a name. He's put into a, he's called good. What does good mean? It means she had a good feeling about him. That's what it means. It, obviously more than a regular mother, she had a good feeling about him, and that's why she chose to endanger herself and to hide him. Look at the pasuk. That means it could be chain, it could be a multiple things. It definitely doesn't mean that the household was lit up and they didn't need electricity. That's what Rashi says. What does that mean? 
that Con Ed went out of business, that all of a sudden it was generating a dynamo of light. What do you think it means? Well, this is not interactive, you're all hush hush. So I'll have to do the talking on both sides. Obviously what it means is since light in Midrashic language and in tefillah is nothing more than a tool of cognizance, allowing cognizance, awareness, that's why we call light a person is a, a person is is knowledgeable and understanding. He's called he's enlightened. He's enlightened because now he has a, a big mass of awareness, cognizance, and ideas. So what you know in this Balatol Bais Aira probably didn't mean to say that the lights went on. It meant to say that there was a feeling of a sense of of awareness of cognizance in his presence. That's, le that's legitimate. They sensed, or she sensed, intuitively, a sense of awareness in his presence. Uh, we could call that an aura, if you want, in literature, okay? A sense of, oh, this kid is special. It was intuitive. She didn't put her finger on She didn't know what it was. She knows she had an intuition that this child is special. Okay, that's, le that's legitimate. And what does she do? So Mrs. Anonymous Mother puts him into a basket, protects him from the elements and puts him into the river. And then anonymous sister, again, she isn't even worth a name either. So this guy doesn't really have a sister, doesn't really have a mother, doesn't have a father, doesn't have a, he's a white. He was born from the Holy Spirit as far as the book is concerned at the moment. Okay, now where's he going? He's in the river. And then some anonymous uh, Pharaoh's daughter, princess picks him up. Now, let's understand, Pharaoh had multiple wives and multiple concubines, as it was very customary in all in life at that era. So let's be honest. So Bas Pari means one of a multitude. Take Achashverosh as an example and read the Megillah and understand norms of biblical kings. Okay, King David at 18, King Solomon had a thousand wives for goodness sakes. So you think King Pharaoh, which is not such a sneeze, Dick and Malukhadort and has only he's a, he, he, one wife, but we cannot be not logical. So Baspari is one of multitudes. He probably had a whole base on Nushim over there. Does she have a name? No. Do we have a record of a name of a daughter of Pharaoh in Divrei Ayama, which married Kala Ben Yefuna? Yes, her name was Bitya. Do we have any indication in the Bible that that is the same, the same Bat Pari of Moshe? No. We do not even know if it was the same Pharaoh, for goodness sakes. Pharaoh is nothing more than a it's like Caesar, it's a king of Egypt. It could be another pharaoh. You have nothing in the Bible. I'm saying Bible. I'm not talking about Midrashim at the moment. You look at the book. The book doesn't give any indication that she was a saint or a holy lady. Nothing at all. She's not even given a name. Mrs. Miss Anonymous. I repeat, trying to make a Xerah Shabbat to the very young is really not honest. It's like deciding there was only one pharaoh with only one name, with, with only one daughter. It's, 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 it's low. You can't do things which are shtusim. That's shtusim. That can't be. So what we have is anonymous daughter, and she picks him up, and she says he's one of the Ivrim, which is interesting. Why do I say Ivrim? Ivrim is very interesting, because Ivrim only means he's me'evel anor. Does she know he's Jewish? Why do I ask the question? Because exactly prior to that time, there was a long era of Egypt, which was ruled by a Semite Bedouin tribe called the Hyksos, H-Y-K-S-O-S. And they ruled at that period of time. It was only later, some dated to this idea of, uh, that, that the Yaka Melechadosh, that now the, the Egyptians, the, the dark-skinned Hamite grandchildren rebelled and took back their homeland, okay? And now, so, so now, but obviously we had Hyksos people there, which were now seen, seen as subservient, so I don't know, did she know she was Jewish or did she just know he was an Ivri? It's interesting to notice because Ivri could be also a member of the Hyksos. It could be, they're both Semites, they're both Neshem. It's something which is worth thinking about. What did she really see when you read the Chumsh? Ivri, Ivri could be the Bnei Yaakov. It could be the, uh, the other people that were ruling here for hundreds of years. That's clearly underlined when they sold Yosef, they sold him to Potiphar, Saris Paroi, Ish Mitzri. Now, can you imagine? You say, I sold you to the um, Secretary of State of the of the American President, which is an American citizen. What do you think he was a Persian? Why would you write Ish Mitzri? 
if he sris pare sara tabachim. The Territ says, because the Stam Sorim and the Stam Srisim at that point in time were not Ish Mitzri, they were Semites. Do your histories, okay? And you'll understand this, okay? The, the Territ underlies that that was not regular to be an Ish Mitzri. Now you can understand why Yosef's brothers didn't recognize him. Otherwise, what's this white guy doing in this dark government? It's like having a white guy in, 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 in Zambia, you understand? He's obviously a Semite, they would have checked it out. The Territ says, because the ruling part of the time were, were Semites. If you really want to know, okay? That's their Haga, that's a free present. That's Pshuta Shul Mikra. Okay, are we Rebbe, together? Rabbi, based on that, how could the Pasuk say that it was a Toeva? I don't talking to me. It's a Lazar, Rabbi. Oh yeah, what? So why would the Pasuk say that it was a Toeva for the Mitzvah to eat with the oh, Ivrim? That, yeah, I, I, I would love to do it, but you have to understand that the Ixas took with themselves all to the norms of the country that they, that, they, uh, that they took in. That's why. That would have to be true. My question is really great. There's a major um, difference in color between B'nai Chom and B'nai Shem. B'nai Shem are the Greeks etc. We're talking about the Mediterranean Basin. They're all like um, like you and me. Okay? And the um, um, the, uh, the other guys, the Bnei Cham, they're more, more like your neighbors. You know what I mean? They sell the oranges by the bridge over there. You know, that it's just something else. So there's a question here which has to be dealt with. Okay, this is not the place. That was just an, an aside, just to show you, you started reading Chumash like a mensch, and then you see so many different things. So then obviously at this stage, what happens is, it's all Mr. Anonymous and he's growing up there. They sent him to, to, the, to, not to, a, to the mother the, to their feed breasting. And, and, and the Ramban said that was for two years. Afterwards, for 10 years, he lived in the house of Pharaoh. When the Pasuk said, that was when he was 12 years old. Seder Oilam. We know he's Dal. What's he Dal? Puberty is 12 to 13. So we end in normal suckling is for two years. Afterwards, puberty is 12, 13, going on 13. That's when these by Dal. That's all we know. Did he know he was Jewish? Interesting. We have no indication they knew he was Jewish. Did he know he was Amram's son? Do you have any indication for that? Do you know he was your Chavit's son? Do you have any indication of that in the book? No. Reality is the Ramban writes he didn't know. The poor kid grew up as an Egyptian prince, prince of Egypt, right? And did, was not aware of his Semite background. Or maybe he was aware of his Semite background, but he didn't know he was Jewish, obviously. He didn't know he was a common slave. And, 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 and what happens is really very interesting is that the day he found out he was Jewish is that day he walked out. That's what Ramban writes. That day, when he was 12, going at 13, whatever you're going to call it, finished his 12th year, starting his 13th year, okay, which is bar mitzvah in a nice way of saying it, that's when he found out he was Jewish. Okay, this is the character that the Torah is telling me about. Telling about a child which has no name, no family, no nothing, a wife drawn out of the water, raised by, by Egyptian princess, which is not aware at all of his lineage until the age. So obviously he wouldn't know anything about monotheism. He did not grow up in a monotheistic community. He didn't know he was anything. So he was probably worshiping the Lord's son or the Lord Ares. Actually, they had a major pantheon of lords. Their major lord was Sun Ra. That's the major lord. And then they had different added lords. Like they have a pantheon, like many other groups. So they were some they worship Neptune. So here they worship Dior. They worship Ares because they like sheep. Whatever it be, there's those are only the semi semi-gods. Like think of the history of a read your Greek mythology, you understand that. So they had multitudes of semi-gods, and the major god was the sun god. Look it up for goodness sakes. And you'll um he ride, make it pnechem, rise the name of the son, Lord's son, the Lord's son. Really want to know ki rap negif nechem? That's what it means. Uh, so you understand? That's what he grew up with. So look at his background. He's frightening. 
the kid doesn't, obviously the two years he was there as a suckling by his parents, he was not, no information seeped in because he was not aware of his Jewish lineage. That means to say they had no effect on his psyche. That means the Torah is telling me he is a clean slate. He has no background. If anything, he has a background of a hedonistic pagan household that he grew up in. Well, let's describe the, the society he grew up in. It's Egypt. I once did this in a very graphic way. I'm going to be nicer here on Zoom. You know, the Pusik says by Bacchus Bukhairis that there's supposed to be like one child in every family, right? And if you read Chumash, Chumash you realize it says up there there were a lot of kids in every household dead, inferring that Father's Day was a very confusing day in Egypt. It's like some neighborhoods you go in Brooklyn that you see only mothers, you don't see fathers. And Father's Day is a very confusing day in certain neighborhoods in Brooklyn. I guess in Manhattan too. Well, in Mitzrayim, it's Mufurish, Mitzrayim, Mizanis, Haisai. And therefore, the lady gave a lot of Bukhairis out, Bukhair for Reuven, Bukhair for Shimon, Bukhair for Levi. She was a source of, of, of Bukhair. And they all died. Is this just the ladies or this common practice? Well, it's very simple. We know the Navi Yecheskel describes the Egyptians as they being like horses. Which means to say, as the Gemara says in Yavamis, they are exceedingly um, active in coitus, in social, uh, in, inter in sexual uh, encounters with no limits. They're like horses to the extent that the Allah says, that's why they don't have a sense of genealogy. There's no yachas of Av Labain. It's like a horse, a horse when he's in heat and the mare is in heat. He's not going to, in, to engage in an encounter in order to get himself a little foal. No, that's not what we're talking about. He's thinking not about yesterday, not about tomorrow. At the moment he's in heat, he's thinking about today. The fact that there will or be not a little offspring coming out of this encounter is really not on his mind. He didn't read the Iger Sakhoidish of the Ramban. Okay, this is a horse. And because of that, there's no really sense of lineage of generations between Goyim. That's the society we're talking about. Jews, on the other hand, are terribly obsessed with children and memory. I always tell the story, one of the most tragic encounters I had was in Karen Biafna, where um, this kid comes into my office. I used to have it in the office building. And, uh, and, uh, and, and he says, and he's very sad. And I ask him, why are you so sad? And he says, because Rabbi, what's the average American family? So I say 1.6 children, 2.5 dogs. Then I live, the dog, dogs are lived by living in the West Side. You see these guys walking around with two little chihuahuas wearing Burberry sweaters, you know, in the winter. Man, I don't own a Burberry sweater myself, but this guy had them for his chihuahuas, for his little dogs, and they're walking on Broadway. It's very hush up to see this sometimes, what people do for a dog, but they only have 1.6 children. So he looks at me and says, Rabbi, I'm a 0.6 child. No one really wanted me. I'm the oops that happened afterwards. You're pregnant? I'm the mistake. It took a lot of years to undo that, that feeling. A lot of, a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, but thank God. Good guy. Yeah, that's what the triumph is. The children are a mistake. Jews are obsessed with children. Let me explain why. Because the Mishnah says in Adios, describe there what the father bequeathed the child. And Rebbe Kiva adds, Afa Dorot You know what you bequeath your children? The total mass of history that is now on your shoulders, which you must give to him for him to find his flavor and take it further. It's called the chain of generations, an accumulation of human experience, which grows and grows with generations and is taught further to the next. Your father gave you the Dorocha Lefanav. I always tell the story when my firstborn was born after many years of marriage and at the Shalom Zacher, Someone asked me, what do you feel? I was quite annoyed for a person asking such a personal question in public. You know, you'd, you'd have to be like my 
the closest person about to be asked me a question like that. But since he was an elder person, I was high b'chloidai. What can I do? So I couldn't just do what I wanted to do, just look at him with a, you know, stare him down and ignore him, which I would have loved to have done. I said, okay, I'll give you a, an answer, but I, don't, I will not elaborate. I said, you understand that until now, I was Laurence Olivier playing Hamlet on the stage. I was the actor in the part. That little red thing screaming found in the back room, he just kicked me off the stage. He's now the actor. I'm producer. Maybe I'll be a director. I don't, if he's like me, he won't let me be a script writer. I just moved to the credits in the back of the movie, not the front. Starring him. Um, you know, the little letters in the back, produced by. Oh, I'll get an Oscar. But not for a great actor, you know, for director, producer. It's a different job. And I thank him for it. Because the beauty of children is that you have now been the reason for the future. And now you can fulfill your task of bringing the past, which is on your shoulders, and, 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 and let it go further into the future. That's the beauty of, of, of children. You know, the tool we use to um, live that way is called the tool of memory. The Bryce says in their Echert Zuta, it says, Here's some of them. Koines, Sofeg, the Zachron. He accumulates experiences, he sponges them in and they live perpetually in his memory. Now, what does that mean? There's a good memory? No, it's a, it's a character trait. You live in the world of memory. Memory is the tool of taking past experiences, storing them in your mind through mental images, and then reliving them again whenever you conjure up those images. It's literally the transporter of the past into the future vis-a-vis -vis the present. That's why memory and children are very special for Jews. We who live mem memory, we who do not live just in the present, but we're constantly tied back to our past and trying to push our past into the future are obsessed with children. You know, um, what kind of society does it take to throw little children into the Nile? What kind of society can be so barbaric, to, at least even metaphorically, to stick children into walls, so to speak? I'm not going into the history of that or not, but the idea behind it is clear. It's child abuse and murder because children are nothing more than the price we pay for our temporal pleasures, and they have no real importance because who cares about the future? At the most, future will be will perpetuated through stones and bricks. But our lifestyle will be totally hedonistic, thinking totally about the present, not caring about the values of the past, not thinking what this will bring in the future. Which if you ever experienced taiva, obsessive desires, then you know that really after you relax, you say, shucks, that was stupid. But if you'd be a man of memory, then you'd always ask, where does this lead to? Where's it coming from and where does it lead to? Then you wouldn't be tied down with obsessive desires. Obsessive desires are only those people as the Rama writes, which is leva ponui mina chachma. If you're a person of chachma, then you're constantly looking for source and ultimately derivative. You don't just enjoy things in today. You must find their source and you must figure out their derivative. You live past, present, and future. That because a man of memory. That's the Talmud Chacham. You know, um, um, next to the Supreme Court in Jerusalem, there is a big pillar which looks like a remnant of a bombed out wall. And on top of it, there is a word with four letters five letters actually, it says Nizakor, we will remember. 
This used to be in the square next to Tachanah Merkazi Jerusalem because they once they built the light rail, they moved it to the front of the um, of the uh, Supreme Court. Historically speaking, at the time, this was supposed to be the first memorial that the country of Israel made for the six million. And there was a big argument between the prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, and the minister of religion, which is the Arab uh, Yudalev Maimon, Arab Maimon, head of the Polo Mizrahi, a signator on the Megillat uh, Atzmaut, Sarah de Tot. You must have heard of Yad Arab Maimon, Mosad Arab Cook, that was him, okay, Arab Maimon. Originally called Fishman, but obviously he trained, he, he, he presided his name to Maimon. We'll let that one go. And um, uh, he wanted it to be, be Yizkor, the God should remember. Well, um, Ben Gurion was not exactly very much into God per se. So he wanted to write Nizkor, that we Jews should remember. Well, as, as it goes in politics, God never wins. So they don't have Yizkor there, there we have Nizkor. I was not aware of the political thing. And always used to think that Yisker, 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 everybody goes to show for Yisker. Like Yisker, the, you know, you grew up with it. That's when those 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 electric things are open in the side of the show. All the names are, you know, that's when the rabbi does the big appeal. Yisker, Yisker. And I came to Israel and I saw this thing said Nisker. I was unbelievably impressed. I remember this as a child. It, it hit me. I never saw a thing like this before. And it says, wow, this makes so much sense. We will all, God always remembers. Don't worry about God. Will we remember is the real question. To what extent will we take the past, translate it to our present and present it further into the future? So I was very much impressed with this Nizkor, because I think that's really our job. We are supposed to be people of memory. You look carefully, you'll see guys impressed, is obsessed with memory, constantly Lamantisco, Lamantisco, Lamantisco. You see it's the trying is something we must constantly remember. There are so many mitzvahs attached to that. We are a theology of memory. And I repeat, that's why children are so important to us. The morale says, you know why a child, a poor gets pishnaim? Two portions. First of all, he's a child. Saying about he's the one that transformed his father from just being a person into being a father. He kicked him off the stage and made him a producer. That was the source of my vort over there with the... Uh, that's the morale. So he gets two, he got two things he did. He gets two portions. We are, yeah, we're obsessed with memory. People who live in memory are type of meadas. They look at their whole reality. They ask where it came from and where it's leading to. If they live that way, they cannot plunge into the world of the das, of the obsessive desires of oil mataiva. These are weeks which we're thinking about that, to how we uh, solve these issues of taiva is through the Rabbim says, Tobel bimei adas. We must immerse ourselves into the world of intellectual thinking. It doesn't just mean saying tillim. It means actually thinking in source reality. Where does this idea come from? Where is it leading to? That's taiva bimei adas then you won't have issues of uh, This was the world that he grew up in. Do you understand where, where Moshe grew up in? Not knowing he was Jewish, thought he was a member of the princely family, grew up, hate to say it, in a cat house, in the house of the Razan son. He grew up in the red light district of Amsterdam. He grew up in Hugh Hefner's palace in Chicago. That's where he grew up. That's where he grew up. Now I look at this, why does the author want to tell me when he tells me all this? The author is telling this to me. I know the situation. I read the third, the author wants to say by not saying any father or mother, he had no influences. They were biological daddy and mommy. Maybe they made his soul or other mystic thing. At the end of the day, no influence. The only influence he had is he grew in base power. But he had a nice stepdaughter mother. All I know, she was a, the harlot of Babylon. 
How do I know who she was? I know she had compassion for a sweet child. If granted, maybe she had a sense of justice, and that's where he learns his sense of justice and the cute sense of justice. Because as soon as he walks out, he sees someone doing something unjust, he kills him. By the way, he has a temper. You have all seen unjust things. You don't kill people. Definitely not when you're 12 years old. He has this anger issue we see through the Bible. He gets angry at his brother. He gets angry at the Jews. He loses it. Chazal say a few times on him. He makes mistakes because of anger, which is beautiful to see. I personally, now, is he? I don't know what Moshe Rabbeinu was. He's a Malach Asorov. I'm talking about the Bebla called character. That's why I'm free to say what is seen in the character. Please uh, don't say Rabbi Blackman is bad mouthing the Gedolim or something. Or, or Moshe Rabbeinu. No, 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 no. I don't know who he is. For all the kids. I don't care. Who he was is totally irrelevant in my theological life. What's important is what does the Kodesh Bochu want to teach me through the literary character depicted in his celestially authored book? And that's what I see. I see a man which has no background. He's a mushroom. You make a shackle near Bedvora on him, not a bird priyadama. He has no roots. He's safna da'ara. You know, he's a mushroom. Nothing influence. The only influence we had is, 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 is maybe a sense of justice coming out from the stepmother because she also did a certain short and certain sensitivity. We see he's got somewhat of a temper. Not very well calculated. He, he looked around and said, there's no one here and he wasted somebody. Well, everybody knew. So he's pretty new to the job. He wouldn't have worked well with Chicago Mafia. You know what I mean? So what are we talking about over here? This guy was like a, a nice warp, a low life, with a good sense of, uh, of, uh, of justice. Now what happens next? Now the author doesn't tell you what happens next. Now the author keeps quiet. Interesting, there's no Medrash Chazal at all describing what happens next. The only source we have something is some book which the Ramban discredits totally and says you shouldn't believe it. It's called a, a mythological book called Sefer Ayosha, which has no theological meaning and value. It's even less than Sefer Maccabi. Okay, so we have nothing. We have no, we have nothing at all in Midrashim and Tereshim except to describe what happens next. We, next time we meet him is 68 years later. We have no, at the end of his, wherever he was rolling around the world, the last trip was to Midian. That's where he met Tzipora. That's where God told him to go to Egypt. He, and then he was 80. So that means for 67 years, the guy is somewhere in the area, in the desert. I don't know where he is. What is he doing? I don't know. Did he, what did he do? Where did he, no, not, not relevant to the narrative. But isn't it important to know how he did things? No. I just want to tell you what happened after those 67 years. After 67 years, he attained a level of prophecy of Shal Nalecha Me'al Raglecha, which the Shema asked the question, why does it say Shal Nalecha Me'al Raglecha? And by Yeshua, it says Shal Nalcha Me'al Raglecha. Did you show only have to take off one foot shoe and he took off two shoes? That's an interesting possibility. Obviously, it doesn't mean that. So we must come to a conclusion that by Yeshua, when it says, Shal nal kami al raglacha, it means make your feet shoeless. And therefore, it's enough to say, Lashin Yachit. Feet is a group. And nalcha is also the group. Make your feet shoeless. So then why do we have a different language and we say shal na'alecha mi al raglecha by Moshe Rabbeinu? The Shalah asks the question, Rebitzel of Elashner brings it down in, uh, in, in Hagor of Ruach Chaim, Perik Aleph, Mishnah Aleph. And the Shalah answers because you have to understand why, why is it that prophets, um, in order to attain prophecy, they have to go, th they have to fall asleep or use imagination and uh, go through some epileptic seizure. 
if you have a red pairing Zion Hilchis Yisraeli Atayra. The, ma- the Navi doesn't see things the way they are. He only sees them. The Maria Ubechida, Upiteron Chakuk Belibo. And even then, only after, as he writes, Evarav Mizdazim, Koya Chaguf Kashel, Vitisher Adat Nuya, Lavin Ulaskil, Bamara Sheroe. Look at Rambam, Perik Zain Sadiator. And the Shalai explains because body awareness is a major static creator and is a buffer, doesn't allow pure intelligence to be. You can't really have a direct uh, uh, communication from God if you have body awareness. So what they do with the prophet is they try to like give him to the terrible seizures, etc. even the perfected human being, which is the prophet, to lose body awareness. And only then, even then, since subconsciously he still has body awareness, he does not hear the words of God. He only sees a, me- a metaphor and he has to interpret. Moshe Rabbeinu is not that way at all. Moshe Rabbeinu, as the Raman points out, lost all sense of body awareness, both, 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 both in consciousness and subconsciousness. He's literally a walking angel. He, he looks in the mirror, sees the neshama, hardly aware of the armony suit called the body. That's not what he sees. When he says the word I, he taki means his neshama, etc. His whole life functions that way. Therefore, he can actually hear God face to face without falling asleep, without having a, uh, a seizure, and without having rhyme and riddle. He can literally hear the word of God. This is all not, this is all found in Rambam, Peri, Zion, Yisraeli, etc. The idea of the body awareness being the buffer is what's explained in the Shola. So the Shola says, you know, there are five names to the neshama, nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaya, and yechida. The only two aspects of that neshama found in the body are nefesh and ruach. That's why you say every morning, elokai, neshama, shenasat be tahirei. And Reb Chaim Velazhner asks, what do you mean? You're a sinful animal. How can you say your neshama is pure? You're a liar. Why don't you say the Torah haita? The answer is no, because your neshama is not expressed in your body, only your nefesh and your ruach. That aspect of the soul, which is called neshama, is not part of your sins. It still is pure. It's your nefesh and your ruach, which has to go through a um, cleaning experience. Just remember that. When your nefesh and ruach is no more expressed in the body because you, you die, that aspect of the neshama called nefesh and ruach goes through a cleaning experience. Look at the of the psukim, v'nichrisu anefashos haosos, etc. Nefesh kitechte. As to exact identification of these, of, uh, these this is obviously this is not the time and place because it's already over time and late. But I want you to understand that for Moses to attain his level of prophecy, he has to literally walk out of his skin, walk out of his body awareness. So the Shalosh says, that's what God told him. Shal na'alecha mi'al raglecha. Take the leather covering over the lower levels of your identity, which is your feet, which means get out of your shoes and get out of your body. There's two separate leather coverings, which are covering your personality. Your shoes, your leather animal hide is covering your feet. And your body is covering, so your body awareness is covering what we will call your nefesh and your ruach. Free yourself from God, from body awareness, then we can have this conversation. That's what the Shola writes. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. So can you understand this, that he was 10 years old, 12 years old, a pagan, that grew up in a cat house, for goodness sakes. You know what I mean? Like he was singing the house of the Luraz and son, you know, he grew up there as the piano man. And here he is, 67 years later, with the capability of walking out of body awareness to the extent he's the most perfect human being in all of human history. Does it say anywhere? Did he go take a course? Did he have a Rebbe? It doesn't say it anywhere. Why doesn't the author, well, we'll find measures, you'll find whatever you want. I'm not, I, I can supply you that if you want, but this is not the question today. Why does the biblical author not tell us that? What is the message 
that the biblical author is telling author is telling us by depicting a character that way. It's a very simple message. This cute kid grew up. You know, I'm talking about like in the worst place possible. Compared to his background, all of your backgrounds were you as if you were born in the family of the Gordon of Vilna. You all have the holiest background. You, I, you didn't grow up in a cat house. You didn't find out you were Jewish at the age of 12. Hello? Like your granddaddy was not exactly the super, I don't want to say what, you know, like a uh, very not sneezing. You know what I mean? Like, I guess they didn't have too much problems of clothing in the area over there. Whatever. It's, it's Kool-Aid's for him. It's Caligula's court. What does the kind of child feel like growing up in Caligula's court? That's where he grew up. And he ran away. And then for 67 years, he suddenly transformed into something totally different. You know what the text is telling you? How do you do it? Ten fingers. He's an autodidact. He did it on his own. What do you think? Who did Avramavino? Who did it for Avramavino? On his own. Read the Chumash. That's what the Chumash is telling you. No influences from the outside. He literally was Mekayim, ain't Anili, Mili. As the Rambam says, it means if you don't have if no one to teach you, you must be your own teacher. There's no excuse because you don't have a good shear or a good Rebbe or a good this. You don't have, break your back, man. You got 10 fingers, use them. People think that in yeshiva, you only know need this finger. That's wrong. If this finger doesn't translate in all 10, you're not learning a word. You got to translate those values in the total mass of your life. This guy took Nothing. He started. From, where did he start from? Where did he get religious training? Don't you understand? This is the man just like my Shabbat of Ramavino. And he attained a level higher than of Ramavino. The only difference is he didn't have any opposition. Because he's where he was in no one's land doing nothing. I don't know what he was doing. He was smoking and meditating for all I know. I don't know what he was doing. But just as Chazal say on Rav Amavinu Kil Yotav Navu the same thing applies here. It doesn't mean his kidneys brought forth wisdom. Kidneys do not have wisdom. It's a metaphor. Obviously, it means internal intuition. Intuition and drive led him to knowledge. And that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is the character, I always used to call him like the first NCSY but without NCSY. And I don't mean NCSY, it's Chaim region. That's a joke. That's not really, I mean NCSY when I was growing up. You know, public school. You know, real NCSY. You know, the way it was. You know what I mean? And you have to understand that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a man that didn't have an organization, didn't have a teacher. That's what the Torah is telling you here. I mean, that's the character. I'm, I did nothing more. There's no medrash here. You don't do any medrash, do anything. I just read the character. So therefore, I am, that, I, I, I am totally convinced with intellectual honesty that this is actually true. Is it also beautiful? To me, it's irrelevant. Is it true? Yes, I'm convinced it's true because I have to look at the character and what would I, as a thinking human being, see in this character? I see. That's why the Torah doesn't say his name. We don't want you to think that, oh, he's the son of, oh, he has these special genes. You know what I mean? He was a blanch al and he made shakul near and his mother's milk and made a seer masechta when he was three for breakfast, lunch, and supper. All these fantasy books, right? No, this guy grew up in a cat house and then he was Jewish till 12 and didn't have a single teacher. And he became who he became. That's the end of the game, guys. I think that's an important piece of information. And the information is that um, um, you got to do it with your 10 fingers. And you have a much better background than he ever had. So, you know, as uh, boots are made for walking, so start walking. Enjoy. Have a great day. Uh, Bain has semesterim. Um, uh,
I still remember when this was innovated and started. I'm very, very happy it's continuing. I do feel a shtickle, a shtickle, a shtickle proud that I'm the one that drove Mickey and, and David crazy about this. Just, I don't think it's right. It, this is not Bain Hasman. No, this man continued. College stopped. Other guys flunked out. You guys are continuing this man. That's the approach. Do not think that you're special. Think you are right. Okay, this man is continuing and you're continuing this man. It's a pity they don't continue the same dop him. That would really send a great message. You know what I mean? This is not Bena semestrium. This man continuing. It's Bena semestrium of college. The yeshiva never stopped. If you understand that, then you take the, you guys do the right thing and take the yeshiva to where it should be. Have a great afternoon. Thank Bye. you so much, Rebbe. Thank you. I'll too. Bye. Moshe, nice seeing you. Ah, bye. <laughs>